Welcome to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal, where our goal is to change the way you practice dentistry by helping you achieve clinical, financial, and personal balance. Now, here's your host, T-Bone. Meredith, welcome back to the T-Bone Speaks podcast. We are going to get started today. One of the most common questions I have received since our live patient implant education has started is what are the economics of getting started and getting into implant dentistry and is it worth it? I thought there was no better person to ask than T-Bone himself about his journey of getting started and what it takes if you wanted to get started today. Well, I think part of that is because I am your boss a little bit, so that's... I I haven't brought you on yet, so before we get into that, (laughs) before we get into that, I have a few things. Um, We are implant, live patient implant education programs are a great way to get started. We'll talk about those in a little bit, but we do have one spot left for the fall. That's August 26th through the 28th and October 6th through 9th, and then I have added an express implant program, November 15th through the 20th. These have three days of live patients, extraction grafts, and guided implant surgery. So let's get into today's episode and talk to T-Bone about his journey. Hello, T-Bone. How's it going? Welcome to the show. Welcome to (laughs) the show with my name on it. (laughs) No. You know, life is good so far. Um, We just finished our implant program, uh, you know, a little bit ago. Express. The Express program, uh, the first time doing that was phenomenal. Uh, a little tiring. I'm still recovering from that. But uh, I do I do want to share with everybody that uh, I thought I was going to get a taste of being an empty nester this summer because we decided to send my son and daughter to an electronic-free camp in the Poconos. And then my oldest son uh, was going to a golf camp for four weeks. And I thought I was going to get a whole month with my wife just us so that we could enjoy each other. Probably she would get annoyed with me, I'm sure. But then... She had big plans. Not with me, I'm me. sure. <laughs> and then about not even a week... Five in, days in. ...into the camp, uh, Abby and Aria call Mona and say that they're dying up there, and that <laughs> they need to be rescued, and that the place is not acceptable. And just like a good mom... Mona ran to their rescue and eight hours them, away and picked them up. And then uh, just the other day, I went and dropped Yash off down to the Hilton Head uh, to his golf camp. And now I don't know how many of you have teenagers, uh, but uh, I will text him and phone call him and he will not return any of my messages, which in one way tells me that he's probably doing OK. No news is good news. But he's 15. Uh, let's remember that. Right. So, you know, what's funny is I my mom called me and um, she goes, have you heard from Yash? I go, no, I've texted him, called him. He gives me one word answers or doesn't respond. She goes, it's OK. He will call you when he needs something. Yes. I go, And I go, yeah, I remember being like that. And then my mom goes, well, you're kind of like that still. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it truly never ends. <laughs> so it truly never ends. So anyway, that's my life update. And now we have three kids at home because we have Abby, Aria, and, and Aria. And a friend. <laughs> Aria's invited Maya over. And I came home and Maya's living with us, which is great. I love yeah. Maya and, and all of that. So she's been living with us. And I just jokingly asked Maya. I said, Maya, when, you know, how long are you staying with us? She goes, Eh, I don't know. No, no, Camp T Bone. <laughs> Camp T Bone, which is great. So it's it's fantastic. Uh, so uh, that's our summer life here at the Agarwal household. Uh, and uh, and then the last thing, this morning I about lost my SHIT because I tried to take my car out the garage and there's three cars parked in front of my mm-hmm. garage door and I couldn't get out of the garage and I just wanted to go slash. All of your tires. Yeah. One of them was your car. No, nope. One of them was my wife's car. Yes. Because where did I park my car? Up at the front. At the front in the parking spot. <clears throat> I try to leave those for the guests. I just pull in like I live well, here. you are the guest. You should park up there. God. <laughs> you, and, my little corner was taken. Usually I'm out uh, of the way. Anyway, let's get on to talking about you ha- And by the way, you had three other car options. You ha- you just chose to take the one that was in the garage. So oh, let's get started <laughs> right. on today's Personal episode. Personal problems. Yes, that's what I mean. 
So today we want to talk about the ROI and getting started into implants. Is it worth it? Um, since we've started this live patient education, that's the question everyone has. Um, is it too late? When should I do it? And you know, there's never a great time. So I thought we would talk about your journey, how you got there, kind of what pushed you, um, what it took, and then what's different about getting into it now. Yeah, you know, I think uh, we always got to look back to where do we start. And implant dentistry, you know, I jokingly call it the gateway drug into what my practice has become. Uh, because implant dentistry was the first area that I niched down and focused on a procedure that no one else in the practice was doing and a procedure that, frankly speaking, still to this date, 12 years later, not enough general dentists are doing. And certainly not enough of them are doing it in a surgical and the restorative side of things. You know, I look back to my journey as a dentist. You know, when I was in dental school, uh, I walked into dental school. My biggest fear uh, going to dental school was having to give shots. I was afraid of needles. <laughs> and see blood. And st- uh, and st- well, the blood part was one thing. but the, You didn't the, know that yet? <laughs> I didn't know that yet. I didn't know dentistry had blood in it. But I was so worried about the needles uh, because I didn't like getting shots. I didn't like giving shots. And I remember, you know, closing my eyes, giving my first few shots in school. But I finally got over that. And then when I got into private practice, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my surgical skill set. Uh, and so I, I simply chose not to take out teeth. And for the first eight years of my practice, uh, sorry, seven years of my practice, I was a restorative only dentist, um, basic bread and butter dentistry. And, you know, I made a nice living. Uh, I had a good practice. I did bigger cosmetic cases. But uh, 2008, the downturn there really exposed that I needed a much broader skill set to be able to sustain economically what we did. And uh, 2008, 2009 really marked the beginning, the real beginning of my journey into implant dentistry. And, you know, for me, I started implant dentistry a few years before that. I took a weekend class. I went there, everything was free-handed, the typodonts didn't bleed, there weren't any tissue on it to raise flash <laughs> on the typodonts. Uh, and you know, I placed a few implants on typodonts, got back, tried to do some implants. It just wasn't as easy as it was on typodonts. I was nervous, I didn't put the implants in as straight as I would like. Um, and it just wasn't a great feeling. My team sensed it wasn't a great feeling. You know, the good news is the patients didn't know any better, so they right. didn't sense anything. Um, but I lost, I, I lost even more confidence. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of you listening out there that have wanting to go into implant dentistry, have maybe taken training in the past, non-live patient training, and you went back to your office and, and you had a failure to launch because, you know, or you launched and you didn't get off to a great footing and you kind of pushed it aside and said, you know, that's not going to work. You know, I wasn't in a position to really be able to not have this succeed. Uh, I needed it. I really needed it. And But I also had that determination that I wanted to do good dentistry. You know, I wanted to do dentistry at a high level. You know, I had slowly, even at that point, built a reputation as a quote-unquote leader within the field. So I, I wanted to live up to those external and internal pressures. And uh, so, Which, by the way leader in the field, your patients have no idea. Yeah, my patients have no clue. <laughs> Which is so funny. Yeah, even when Still tra- to this day. Even when the training center was upstairs yeah. in the office, right. uh, they had no idea. Yeah. So, um, And that's probably an area that we could probably do better at. You know, Maybe if I had a marketing person on the team that could let patients know that I'm a leader in the field. Um, one off topic, but one of my favorite things is the first or second year I was working for you, I went to Dent Splice Rona World and someone came up to me and said, what's it like working for T-Bone? And I was like, what are you talking about? I work at a dental office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like yeah. what? You, you know, we're just a regular dental office. Did you tell them I walk around with my hands down in my pants just like every other guy? No. I was like, <laughs> what? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, but speaking of Dent Splice Rona World, um, it was that technology mm-hmm. that really changed my view and execution of implant dentistry. You know, adding CBCT, being able to see the bone before I started, 
being able to have good confidence that I knew what size implant there was, that there was adequate bone, that I wasn't going to lay the tissue open and then find that there wasn't adequate bone, and then not having the skill set to fix that. Knowing that I could choose green light cases really changed the game for me. Right. And, and looking back at 2008, 2009, how we did guided surgery at that time, the costs uh, I, I remember getting my first guide made cost almost six hundred dollars wow. to have a guide made, and it still made economic sense to yeah. do it. And you know where we've come today in two thousand twenty one, where uh, we can have literally a guide printed in forty five minutes, you know, planned, designed, printed, ready to go in about forty five minutes, um, at a cost of you know a little bit of time and a few bucks. Um, uh, really speaks volumes to where technology has gone and how it has changed the game. So I will forever be um, grateful and dependent on technology to really move me to the next steps. And that's that's always been my, my plan uh, or my plan of execution from implant dentistry. Like I said, it was the gateway drug. It was the reason I bought CBCT. It was the purpose for me, and I used it to leverage that. And since then, we've used technology to leverage cosmetic dentistry, to leverage sleep apnea dentistry, to leverage orthodontics. Technology has been that key role. So, uh, you know, that's kind of been my journey. Uh, I started with green light cases, which were, you know, single edentulous, already edentulous sites with adequate bone. I moved into socket preservation at that point because then I realized that I needed to pre I needed to create these sites. Right. You know, because you know, it was one thing for people to walk in uh, with these sites, but then I started noticing that a lot of people that had teeth taken out a year or two years before didn't have adequate bone to place an implant. And I was losing out on those cases because I wasn't comfortable with the grafting or the pre-implant grafting. And that's when we made the decision that I needed to get better at socket preservation and preparing a site for an implant. Uh, so that's why I believe uh, socket preservation, atraumatic extraction is so important that we made it a, core pro a part of the core program in our implant continuum. Uh, and, and then after I got through socket preservation, then I went into immediate implant placement, uh, which really uh, kind of really stepped it up, stepped up the game in terms of the number of implants I could do, the patient reaction to that. Then we went to anteriors, then I went to full arch, and I'm still learning. Like, you know, now we're doing sinus lifts, we're doing more complex uh, implant placement, you know, we're starting to get into pins and pre-implant grafting. All these things that for me, I didn't look at it as I need to learn it all first and then move in. I looked at it as I was going to have a staged approach. Build and, a foundation on implants. Yeah, and absolutely. And implant. have a staged approach to it yeah. that I could build upon. And the beauty of implant dentistry is I'm not certain that the learning will ever stop in implant dentistry. I think unlike anything else that's out there with any other discipline within dentistry, it is truly a lifelong learning process. I mean, if I wanted to, and I, I, I never say never, but I could learn to get into zygomas or pterygoid <laughs> implants, all these things that I look at that just like I used to you, look at a yeah. full arch and say I'd never, never do gonna that. Do it. And so I hesitate to say I, I won't do that, but there's always that. And then there's the technology side of implants and, and how that's changing. So, you know, my journey has been uh, very professionally rewarding. I feel like uh, I'm growing each year professionally and personally. Uh, certainly there's been the economic rewards of it uh, and there's been the practice rewards of it. And I hope uh, through this podcast we get to talk about how the dynamics of our practice has really changed as well. Well, before we wrap up your journey, <laughs> I would like for you to share with everyone your first implant and how many PAs you took. Yes, yes. Because I have had people say, I've placed a, a few implants. I just don't think it's for me. They didn't go well. Um, it's not guided. They don't have CBCT or they have CBCT, but it's not guided and they don't have a great workflow no. and they just think it's not for them, but they, they want it to be. Yeah. So maybe you could encourage a couple people by letting them know how your first implant went to see how 
getting a great workflow and using and leveraging that technology has created event list industry. Yeah, you know, um, you know what's interesting <laughs> is um, you don't realize your journey until you kind of reach towards the end of it. I don't like to say mm -hmm. the end of it because I'm not at the end of my journey. Uh, and then you look back and I look back at my first implant and I joke and tell this story. And I, I remember my, my very first implant was, I, I went, again, I went to my weekend course, I got back, I bought 10 implants, I bought a drill, I bought a motor, they, you know, they tapped me on the, on the buttocks and said, go get them. And I found a, a patient to uh, agree to let me place an implant. I took a PA x-ray, I had no CBCT at the time. Uh, I took the PA, I determined that the nerve is far away, we're gonna place this implant. Uh, the patient walks in about a week or two after we do the diagnosis, I take another x-ray in case something had changed. You never know what's changed in two weeks. Um, I lay my flap, I take the blade, I take another x-ray in case you know I bladed off the bone or something. Uh, I took uh, my round burr, made a dimple like we were taught in our freehand program. I uh, took another x-ray to make sure that was on angle. <laughs> And then I took my pilot drill, went in a few millimeters, uh, took another x-ray to make sure I wasn't off. And then I had planned on placing like a 10 or 11 millimeter implant. I don't remember exactly at the time. And so I started drilling down about eight, nine millimeters into my 11 millimeter osteotomy and, and blood started coming out. <laughs> and I don't remember the typodonts having blood <laughs> or bleeding, but I do remember my instructor telling us that bleeding in the mandible could be a sign of a artery or nerve. And I, w I know that I wasn't close to the mental foramen, but I know I was kind of around it. So then I started freaking out that there's blood coming out of this. And you know, looking back now, I know that bone bleeds <laughs> because that's how bone gets its nutrient supply. Uh, and then so I decided that, you know what, I'm just going to place an eight millimeter implant. I'm going to plug the hole up. I look at Liz, my assistant at the time, who amazingly is still with me. Um, <laughs> Amazing. She came back after that day. <laughs> I know. Um, and she went to our inventory of 10 implants and said, none of them are eight millimeters long. <laughs> so I said, at this point, I've had the patient open two and a half hours. I've been, you know, uh, irrigating the site with the sweat from my forehead and salty, <laughs> just like saline. Uh, and I said, let's mm, just put, a, let's put an 11, 11 millimeter implant in the site and it'll fail and we'll deal with this later. Uh, and sure enough, the implant didn't fail. Uh, and, you know, that, that kind of was my first foray into implant dentistry. Uh, and, but, you know, I, but I, I think to credit to myself, uh, the most important part of that was I was committed to winning. Right. A and, lot of people would have given up. Yeah. And I was I committed think. to winning to getting the resources I needed to be able to do that. And I, I think that's what's important. The, and the resources are education. The resources are the right tools at the right time for the right job. You know, that's kind of where we developed the instrument mm -hmm. kit. To be able to have it, like you know, I we heard back from a specific attendee. I don't want to use names. Who went back to do one of her first implants after the class, and and she texted me and says, "Now I know why you're talking about the right tools." She goes, "Because I didn't have everything I needed. Because I was, you know, I listened to the internet, and the internet said, oh, you don't really need that.'" And I'm like, "Just we're talking about doing millions of dollars in dentistry over our career. Why are we arguing over a few thousand dollars yeah. to get started right?" Mm -hmm. And and I you know I, and I think that really hit home with with her in this particular situation. So yeah, that that was my first implant. Yeah. So since then, you moved on to leverage technology, things like PRF that have made your implants more predictable yeah. um, and I'm easier. Still, but I'm still afraid to draw the blood. Uh, yeah. So that's what I was going to move into next. I was going to say it's also elevated team members yes. into roles that otherwise would not be available. Yeah. Um, so that would be one of them. Your assistant has become kind of what we call, we have champions in our yeah. practices and we call them the implant champion. So she keeps stock on the implants, keeps all the cases under control, make sure, you know, everything is there for the implant probably the week before, um, draws all the blood, does the PRF. So that wouldn't be possible if you weren't doing implants. She would just be a general assistant. Yeah, you know, um, I often, I kind of refer to this as side effects. You know, one of the side effects of adding implants to the, into my practice are how it changed the dynamics of my practice. And I wasn't expecting this at all. Uh, in fact, when I started doing implant dentistry, it was, 
it was about adding five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to the practice because I needed it to economically survive in the times that we were in at that mm-hmm. point. But as I committed to it, as I tasted success, it became a bigger and bigger part of our practice. Now, implant dentistry isn't everything I do and all I do, but it's changed the dynamics of my practice in a couple of ways. Um, and I want to get to the uh, team members part of it here in a second. But I think the first side effect of implant dentistry was that I started having implant-only days. Mm-hmm. Doing be- more of be doing more of that. The dentistry right? you love. Well, that I turned out to love, right? right? And I started being able to say no, no. to other things economically. Mm-hmm. And it started to really shape my schedule, shape what I did in the practice. And what it did was it opened my eyes that I needed an associate in mm-hmm. my practice. So I needed another dentist in my practice. And I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't have that realization or have that need. And I didn't anticipate. I never expected when I started my practice to need another dentist because I'm not the easiest person to get along with in the practice. I have super high expectations. I'm all about, you know, I'm I'm a type A personality, very driven person and hold people to high standards. But I needed somebody. And what was amazing to me was – that when I got an associate in my practice, it only opened more doors to do more implant dentistry because I had more time. And that's, a, that's something I think is lost uh, in people when they're thinking about, hey, I'm going to add a new procedure to my practice. I think we lose, lose that concept of the side effect of how it's going to change the dynamics of our practice or how we should let it change the dynamics of the practice. I I keep hearing a lot of people say, I don't ever want to give that up. And I go, I said that too. Mm -hmm. I said like right now I'm saying, I don't want to give up cosmetic dentistry, but I'm letting that, starting to let that happen because it's opening the doors to do more of the things I want to do, things that fit my personality, my stage of life a little bit more. So it's changed the dynamics of our practice from that sense. Number one, it taught me the benefit of blocking specific times. Uh, whenever I decided that, hey, I want to do five implants a month, the first step was make five blocks. When I decided I want to do 10 implants per month, make 10 blocks. 15 implants a month, take, take 15 blocks. 20 implants per month, make 20 blocks. But to make those blocks, I also had to push other stuff to the oh. side or farther out. Uh, and so, so that's, I think, one of the things that holds a lot of dentists back is that aspect of it. And another side effect of implant dentistry was how it changed our team members. And, you know, I think it's very timely given how difficult it is to hire and find great people. And I hear a lot of people saying, you know, I'm losing some of my team members to others. And, you know, my first thing is people don't always leave because of money. I think a lot of times people leave because there's not upward mobility. And upward mobility is so important. And upward mobility comes from the dentist having upward mobility. So as the dentist earns more or does more, you know, by definition, you kind of pull people along with you. And, you know, the traditional model or the traditional mindset around personal growth has been to become more efficient and do more fillings and crowns or see more patients, basically. Yes. It's not necessarily about what you're doing, but the model is if I need... Work harder. <clears throat> yeah, the model is I need to work two chairs, two yeah. hygienists, because mm-hmm. I need to do more of the same. Some of them are working four and five hygienists. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know Just how so they do know. that. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, the model, what implants taught me was that I needed to slow down to speed up. I uh-huh. needed to really focus in. I needed to be able to go into a room for 20, 30, 45, 50 minutes, an hour, do my work, not be bothered with other things, you know, block off that kind of time. And then I needed more and more support from my team members, whether it was guide fabrication, whether it was managing inventory with our implant reps, whether it was managing complex cases with laboratories, whether it's doing the consults and the financial arrangements, whether it's uh, producing the guides, whether it's planning restorations and designing the restorations, milling out the restorations, you know, whether it's now PRF, whether it's now, you know, all, you know, managing, you know, there's a lot that goes into full arch implant cases, you know, and, and that's really allowed us to see an avenue for people to grow personally 
And, and of course, as they grow personally, as the practice grows personally, they do grow economically. Uh, I believe economic growth is, you know, towards the latter half of that, as the business is growing, as we're proving the timeliness and the sustainability of it, uh, I think rewards do come. But uh, I think the side effects of implant dentistry have been tremendous. And, and that that is why I am so so in favor of adding implant dentistry. And it's why we're making it a priority at 3D Dentist to have live patient education, to have a complete implant curriculum where, where we can be a solution for them on that journey. Uh, because my view is that I want to recreate what was successful for me. What was successful for me was sing onesie, twosie, single, onesie, twosie, green light implant cases then add anteriors, immediates, then move into the full arch world, add PRF, do sinus lifts. All these other things become secondary to getting started. started. And getting started is the most important thing. And there's an abundance of patients, green light patients already in our practice that we can get to that five implants per month pretty, pretty, pretty readily if we make it a focus, if we understand the technology, understand the workflow, understand some of the basic business skills to help propel us into that world. And, and I think that's uh, kind of uh, built into our programs and, in my opinion, what makes it stand out uh, differently than other programs out there. Yeah. So let's talk about if somebody is interested yeah. in attending a course or getting started. Um, you know, their first option is where do I find the, yeah. I think their first thing they start looking for is where do I find the education? Yep. Um, and then once they go there, they, what do I need to take that yeah. education? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a great segue. <laughs> um, so unlike probably most people, I, I will tell people that we're, we, 3D dents may not be the right choice for everybody. Yes. I think there's a personality part of it. Uh, our personality is, is a lot of fun. Uh, very practical information. A lot of people are looking for a lot of science. If you're looking for a lot of science, it's not the place. You know, we use proven techniques that have worked in our own practices. But anyway, if you want to get started with implant dentistry, you don't have to take expensive education. You, you simply don't. You can buy Carl Misch's textbook. You can go on YouTube. You can go on SlideShare. And you can learn everything you need to learn didactically about implant dentistry. If your budget allows a little bit more, you can move to a hands-on program uh, where you can get some of that science lectures on your own, get some of the practical knowledge through the instructors, and get some hands-on programs on typodonts, pig jaws, things like that. And for a lot of people, that's enough to get going in their practice. Um, and, and so that option exists for people as well. Now, the next question people often ask is, what do I need to get started? So we've covered the basics of education, the traditional route. The other thing that you need traditionally to get started in implant dentistry is pretty simple. You need an implant motor, okay, because your traditional low speed and high speed doesn't have the torque and the speed control that we need uh, for implant dentistry, and it doesn't necessarily typically have external irrigation so that we can get sterile solution into the, into the surgical site. Uh, so you need a motor, you need an implant handpiece, and you need implant drills. Uh, and, you know, you can get started with a basic setup of implant drills and, and implants uh, with a motor probably in the five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 ballpark. You know, somewhere in that ballpark will get you started with the basics you need to get started in implant dentistry combined with the next to free education. That's the most simple, most economic way to get into implant dentistry. It's not the way I would recommend because it leaves a lot of things to chance. It, it, you know, it's not, it's not organized, it's not progressive, uh, and it, it, it allows you to quit, quite frankly, is, is really the problem with doing that. Now, the way I chose to focus on it, the way I teach on it, the way we be firmly believe in implant dentistry is we believe implant dentistry should be done at the highest level uh, and it should be done with the most predictability and the most uh, scalability. And technology delivers that. So for me, I, a minimum to place implant dentistry in my world is a CBCT. I believe that every general dentist that's going to be placing implants 
should have a CBCT in their office. You know, you can get into the world of CBCT in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar ballpark. When I got into CBCT, it was one hundred and twenty thousand, one hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars back in two thousand and eight. So now we're at the fifty, sixty thousand dollar mark. If you get lucky and find a good used one or a demo one, you could probably get in in the thirty, forty thousand dollar mark. But that's what I think you need at a minimum to get started with implant dentistry. Now, if you really want to kind of boost that a little bit and make the workflow a little bit better, having a digital impression system uh, is fantastic as well. And today's world, you can get into digital impressioning starting in the $15,000, $17,000 ballpark with good quality digital impression systems. So we, we, we take a very technology-based approach to it, CBCT, digital impressions, uh, we believe in uh, all guided surgery 99% of the time. Our intention is to place every implant with guided surgery. I know others will disagree with that, uh, but our intention is to do that even in cases where I don't believe the guide is going to work from an opening perspective. I'll make a pilot guide to get me started so I can ensure that we're getting in the right spot. And then we'll kind of go from there. So, you know, th that's kind of what I believe. I believe there are some ancillary things that I think are optional that will really allow you to do very good implant dentistry. Uh, the first ancillary item I think that you should have is probably PRF. And the reason I choose PRF first is I think it plays a vital role in socket preservation and allowing good bone handling, good healing, and allowing you to create good implant sites. Uh, so I think anything that allows you to create good implant sites should be higher on your list. And then the secondary thing that I think uh, is helpful is an ISQ. We happen to use the Beacon from Ostel. Uh, there is a Penguin system out there that's slightly less expensive, but I really like the Beacon system. I like the green light, yellow light, red light. I like how it's cordless. I like how it has a cloud-based system, keep track of your patients and, and your readings. Uh, and so... I believe that is also very helpful. It gives you a level of confidence that has a high level of benefit, especially when you're starting out in the implant dentistry world. And I think, you know, when you're starting out, the most important thing is confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, confidence and the ability to get launched. What will allow me to get started with confidence? That's what you need. And it, it is going to vary from person to person, but whatever allows you to get started the quickest, whatever allows you to have the most confidence is what you need. And and a soapbox from my end is, is all this bickering and arguing over which system to choose, which system has, you know, oh, I can get this guided kit, but then use this, and all this, you know, hodgepodging and putting things together. Look, that works. I do it. But I didn't do it when I started. I, I started doing that as I reached a level where that became a little bit necessary. Look, the average general dentist, a successful average general dentist, is probably going to place somewhere between 30 and 50 implants per year. Now, I know some are going to do more, some are going to do less, but that, that's a successful general dental practice as placing implants, 30 to 50 implants. And we're arguing over, which, which by the way, is close to $200,000 a year in revenue mm -hmm. and per year for the rest of your career. And we're arguing over three, four thousand dollars to get started, and it doesn't make any sense to me. What what I say, again, it's a soapbox, okay? So I'm not, it's my opinion. <laughs> what I say when I hear people asking these questions or really concerned about this is, I say you're not committed to win, because if you really believe in yourself and if you're really committed to win, then you'll get what you need to win. You know, most of us don't skimp when we start our practice on location. We shouldn't skimp when we're doing surgical procedures on our, on our patients. So I believe in having the right tools for the right time, you know, whether it's the right implant system, the guided drill, the full kit, whether it's the right implant motor, because not all motors are created equal, whether it's the right implant system, which is a religion, like which system is the best, uh, having CBCT, digital impressions, PRF, the ISQ meter, the right surgical instruments like the 3D surgical kit, which I think is phenomenal. Um, you know, I believe you got to have the right stuff to do the job. And the confidence, which Absolutely. comes from the training, the mentorship, um, what you learn, who you meet. That way you have them to 
kind of bounce ideas, run cases by yeah. as you get into your journey. So what everyone came here for <laughs> was the ROI and the economics of getting started in implant dentistry. So you went over the things in order to give your patients the best standard of caring, um, they would need education, a CBCT, digital scanner, motor, an implant package, mm -hmm. and biologics. We yep. went through this and averaged about a hundred thousand yeah. dollars in getting started maybe a little bit less maybe a little bit less depending on what you get um and then we said that most dentists do three to five implants a month right so that puts them at 140 to two hundred thousand dollars back in your first year yep. if you get right into it yep. um so i think that gives us an roi that is worth it is worth it because this is for the long run yeah, right absolutely. This so it's one year for years and years of yeah. So, and, and, and the common question we'll get is, oh, I'm 60 years old. You know, that doesn't make sense. Like, we had that last weekend. Yeah, we got five years, you know, yeah. 10 years left. Or more because now you're doing something that reinvigorates you. And is less taxing on you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and you know, I want to give an economic example, if you guys don't mind, uh, of the onesie twosie implant. You know, in my world, here's what I've written down. Here's what it takes to plan, place, and restore a dental implant in my world. One, you've sunk the cost in technology because here's what I know. From experience and from having done this and teaching a lot of dentists like you, a lot of you listening have bought CBCT and digital impressions for the diagnosis and the capabilities restoratively. So you already have the technology in your practice. It's a sunk cost. In other words, whether you use it or don't use it, you pay for it. And a lot of you that have been with me a long time have already paid for this stuff. It's paid right. off, okay? So it's a sunk cost. So here's what's involved in every implant you place. Cost of goods sold, okay? The goods that you need to deliver an implant from beginning to end. You need a surgical guide, you need an implant, you need an abutment, and you need a crown. We're living in a world where a surgical guide can be anywhere from $10 to $200 to get a onesie twosie surgical guide made. We're living in a world where dental implants, quality, rep-driven, supported implants can be had in the $200 to $300 ballpark. We're living in a world that when you place your implant guided, you place it with a restorative-driven approach. You can use a tie base, a stock abutment uh, designed for CAD CAM, whether it's through the lab or through yourself. Uh, you can use that. And then we're living in a world where basically you can mill a lithium silicate or disilicate uh, restoration over this stock abutment. You know, with a guide that's anywhere between $10 and $200, an implant that's anywhere from two to $300, an abutment that's typically in the $50 to $75 ballpark, and a crown block, uh, whether that's, you know, whether you do it yourself, you're in the $60, $70 ballpark, or send it to a lab for the $300 ballpark, you can plan, place, and restore a dental implant anywhere from $400 to $1,000 start to finish for a plan, placed, and restored dental implant for a procedure that on average will bring in a revenue of three to $5,000. to $5, The ROI economically on onesies makes so much sense. Now suddenly when you start placing two implants on a single patient, the profit margin exponentially grows. Skyrockets. And what's important is the methodology that we employ and teach in our practice and teach a 3D dentist is that the average onesie twosie implant should be no more than 90 minutes of chair time. 90 minutes of scheduled chair time from beginning to end. That includes the consult records, placing the implant, uh, restoring the implant should be no more than 90 minutes. And uh, it just makes sense. And, and for those of you that are still on the fence that say, hey, my practice is doing great. Uh, I thought that same thing in 2008, we were doing as good as we could possibly do, and then the economic downturn hit us. I'm not saying that we're gonna have an economic downturn or wishing that on us, but there's the very good chance that we're gonna face tougher times within the next four, three, four, five years, and setting your practice up, future-proofing your practice today uh, will pay off in spades uh, for the long run of your practice, and there's side effects to all of this that are positive side effects that you just can't imagine for yourself. Yeah, I mean, now is the time to get started on implants when you can do one implant in less time than a crown or a couple of fillings. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, for those of you that are interested in getting into implant dentistry, I'm happy to talk to you. Send me an email. 
uh, send me a direct message. Uh, if you feel that 3D dentists or our training could be a good start for you, please reach out to me or Meredith. Meredith's happy to hop on the phone with you. If it's something where you just need a little bit of a push, she'll be happy to schedule a time for you and I to talk about it so that we can make sure it's the right place for you, that it's the right uh, solution. And I think our unique selling proposition are a couple of things. Our retreat is amazing. Uh, the experience, the camaraderie, uh, the deep dive into implant dentistry, uh, the level of implementation is bar none the best in dentistry uh, because of the retreat. And then number two, having live patient education where, you, where we provide you patients based here in the U.S. in a very safe environment uh, is fantastic. So uh, if we can be of assistance, please let us know. Thank you guys for joining me. Meredith, thank you for bringing me on to my show <laughs> and leading me along the way. And we will see everybody next week on the T-Bone Speaks podcast. Thanks so much for listening to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal. Remember to keep striving for excellence and we'll catch you on the next episode.